Join me as we pray. Holy God, as the risen Christ opened the minds of the disciples to understand the Scriptures and gave them power through your Holy Spirit to walk boldly in this world, open your people today to the healing, to the wisdom, to the faith that is given through your word. Amen. Today, as Sophie has already given us a great illustration for, we're reading from this book about the early church, the book of Acts. We're picking up in chapter 3, verses 1 through 19. Hear now God's word for us today. Peter and John were going up to the temple at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the established prayer time. Meanwhile, a man crippled since birth was being carried in. Every day, people would place him at the temple gate, known as the beautiful gate, so that he could ask for money from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he began to ask them for a gift. Peter and John stared at him, and Peter said, Look at us. So the man gazed at them, expecting to receive something from them. Peter said, I don't have any money, but I will give you what I do have. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, rise up and walk. Then he grasped the man's right hand and raised him up. At once his feet and ankles became strong. Jumping up, he began to walk around. He entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God. They recognized him as the same one who used to sit at the temple's beautiful gate asking for money. They were filled with amazement and surprise at what had happened to him. While the healed man clung to Peter and John, all the people rushed toward them at Solomon's porch, completely amazed. Seeing this, Peter addressed the people. You Israelites, why are you amazed at this? Why are you staring at us as if we made him walk by our own power or piety? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus. This is the one you handed over and denied in Pilate's presence, even though he had already decided to release him. You rejected the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you instead. You killed the author of life, the very one whom God raised from the dead. We are witnesses of this. His name itself has made this man strong. That is, because of faith in Jesus' name, God has strengthened this man whom you see and know. The faith that comes through Jesus gave him complete health right before your eyes. Brothers and sisters, I know you acted in ignorance. So did your rulers. But this is how God fulfilled what he foretold through all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer. Change your hearts and lives. Turn back to God so that your sins may be wiped away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Recently, if you happen to turn on your television to watch the Atlanta Hawks basketball team playing against the Oklahoma City Thunder, you may have wondered if there was something wrong with your screen. If you're like me, you generally find it helpful to know the color of each team's jersey so that you can tell who is who. And yet on this particular night... People tuning in had a terrible time telling the teams apart from one another. 
You see, the Hawks decided to wear their alternate uniforms for this game. Not an uncommon thing to see on the court. However, it just so happened that for this very game, the OKC Thunder also decided that they would wear their alternate uniforms too. And the result of this little oversight was nothing short of a mass of confusion. Because the Hawks came out in their red jerseys and the Thunder came out in their red-orange jerseys. And especially for all of those watching at home, it appeared as though all the players were on the same team. (laughs) The story, of course, immediately blew up all over social media. It was so bad that someone from the league had to call in and tell the Thunder that they had to change their uniforms for the second half. Because, as it turned out, Atlanta, being the away team, had only brought the one pair of jerseys for this game. (laughs) So often we rely on the color of jerseys to tell us who we're rooting for or against. It's true of most sports and in many other aspects of our life as well. Even political parties and candidates are referred to by the metaphorical color of their uniform, whether it be red or blue. The colors of the teams we cheer for help us to know who's on our side and who might be cheering for that other team. And if you've ever been to a heated sporting event, you've probably seen how easy it is to reduce a person down to whatever team they're wearing with the judgment that comes along with it. This is either friend or foe. Believe it or not, this has everything to do with our scripture from the book of Acts. When Peter and John heal a man who was crippled since birth, I wonder if it would be helpful for us to imagine all the participants in this story wearing uniforms. At first, it might be hard to tell where people stand, which team they belong to. I think our minds naturally want to find ways to divide people into different groups to help us make sense of the story. So in essence, we picture Peter and John, two of Jesus' disciples, on one side, and on the other, we have this Israelite crowd that Peter is addressing, who he criticizes for rejecting Jesus as the Messiah. And since we self-identify as Christians, as disciples of Jesus, it might be tempting for us to take sides in this story. We might feel drawn to stand behind Peter and John. And as a result... We might think of the Israelites as part of this opposing team. And then it becomes a story about two competing teams, the disciples versus the Israelites in an all-out battle for the soul of Jerusalem. And maybe you can already see how this point of view very quickly becomes problematic. Because if the Israelites are the opposition... Our natural tendency is to want to win against them, to defeat them at any cost. And perhaps that leads us to even see them not just as opponents, but as enemies. And indeed, that is exactly what has happened in the centuries following this encounter in Acts right up to today. There have been many Christians who have misused scriptures like this one to make anti-Semitic remarks uh, about Jewish people of their day. So let's remember for a second that Peter is himself a devout Jew, speaking to his fellow Jewish, that is, Israelite audience, about how their Hebrew Messiah had been crucified and raised. Peter is telling them that the miracle of a crippled man being healed was done in the name of Jesus, 
the Son of God, the same God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, whom they worship and serve. That means that if we were to imagine this scene playing out with everyone wearing jerseys, then Peter and John and the healed man and all the Israelites gathered outside the temple would be wearing the same uniform. Every last one of them. They all identify as faithful people of God. So this is not a battle of words between two opposing teams. This is a player named Peter, standing up in the locker room at halftime and addressing his fellow teammates to encourage them and say, hey, we are all on the same team here, so let's work together. Like many teams throughout history, this Holy City squad was struggling to operate as one. They were fighting amongst each other. Some refused to listen to the coach's instructions. And as a result, their performance left much to be desired. How could they possibly face the challenges ahead unless they got their act together and started working as a team, as a family of beloved children of God? I know this might be a stretch to imagine Peter and John and their fellow Israelites in this way, but I'm going to invite you to hear Peter's words one more time through this context as people who are all on the same team. Peter says this, Friends, why are you amazed at this? Why are you staring at us as if we made this man walk by our own power or piety? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus. This is the one you handed over and denied in Pilate's presence, even though he had already decided to release him. And Peter goes on, Brothers and sisters, I know you acted in ignorance, but this is how God fulfilled what he foretold through all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer. Change your hearts and lives. Turn back to God so that your sins may be wiped away. When I hear it that way, I don't imagine someone chastising their opponents out in the street. I hear someone who sees himself as one of their own, a member of this team who is doing everything he can to bring everyone together. And if they are going to work together, then they must do more than just stand around in amazement as they witness the miracles of God through Jesus Christ. No, just as Peter says, they must repent, that is, turn around, so that they will all be moving in the right direction once more. The physical act of repentance is what leads to being a full participant in God's work in the world. In other words... Discipleship is not a spectator sport. Here's your uniform. Now go, get dressed, and jump into the action so that you can be part of what God is doing. And you know what's great about discipleship? It's not a solo sport either. No one is expecting you to do this all alone. You have a team of disciples to stand by your side with Christ himself at the center, leading us on. If there's one other takeaway from Peter's halftime speech here in Acts 3, I think it's this. One of the best metaphors for discipleship might just be that hot mess of a game between the Atlanta Hawks and the Oklahoma City Thunder. You heard me. Because as crazy and confusing as it may sound, 
all of us children of God are playing on the same team. We are all disciples for the same God. So whether we're from Atlanta or Oklahoma or Israel, or whether we identify as red or blue or green or purple, it turns out that we're all wearing the same color jersey. And yes, that is confusing at first, especially if you've been taught that the other people on the court are supposed to be your opponents. But in truth, they are your brothers and sisters. And we have been on the same side this whole time. How might seeing the world like that change your view of what it means that you are a disciple? Maybe it becomes less about convincing others to join your side or imagining faith as this struggle that must be won no matter the cost. And maybe it becomes less about the score or any of those other silly metrics we think are important because we're all on the same side anyway. Who cares which church had more people in the pews last week? We are all on the same side. And who cares whether someone wears a coat and tie or a t-shirt and sandals to church? We're all wearing the same spiritual jersey. I wonder how much better off the world would be if disciples truly saw each other as teammates rather than opponents. Do you think people would be amazed? Would they leap up and praise God? Would they repent and change their hearts and lives, having seen God's mercy in action? When I worked in youth ministry and we would play a game together, without fail, someone would always ask, what's the score? And my answer was always the same and it is the cheesiest and the most theologically sound statement I know. The score is tied fun to fun with Jesus in the lead. <laughs> and the youth would just roll their eyes at me. My hope is that maybe, just maybe, a small seed was planted those days. One that said discipleship is not about winning or keeping score. It's about following. And if we follow the right person, we will discover a joy in Christ's victory over death that far surpasses anything we could achieve on our own. Thanks be to God that Christ is victorious and that he has more than enough spots on his team for us to join in. But there is one caveat. You knew there would be one. Whatever jersey you have been wearing will need to be traded in. On God's court, we all wear the same uniform. But then again, that is the best way to identify who's on your team. I think Paul said it best when he called it clothing yourself with Christ. That's what he said in his letter to the Galatians. And I think his words would go perfectly on a sign that everyone sees before they go out onto God's court. All of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, if you belong to Christ, then indeed you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. Today, may we be made one in Christ, one faith, one people, one team, and yes, one uniform, 
so that we can face any challenge together with Christ in the lead. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.